Hey guys, Chris Clothier here with another episode of the Grind Podcast. Hope you are having a fantastic uh, into your week here. Getting ready to go into the weekend. Hope you have fantastic plans, lots of fun, and you've been productive. I know that this has been an amazing week for us here at uh, REI Nation and for the whole team at the Grind. And I get to end the week with one of my favorite topics, but you're going to hear me say that a lot over these next few weeks because we've lined out the list, we've made the calendar, and I'm actually fired up. I love the topics that we're going to be talking about here, but this one is one that I like so much because um, it, it, it allows me to kind of unpack a bit of my own brain and talk a little bit about what I think successful investors do better than those that are not successful. And here's how I define successful, just so we're clear. It's not money, it's not number of houses, it's none of that. It's all based on what were your expectations. And success means that you had an expectation and you hit it. That's how I define success. I don't I can't tell you if you're being successful or not. I mean, that's that would be basing it on my own perceptions and my own expectations of an investment. The reality is that you're the only one that knows if you're being successful or not, and it's are you hitting the expectations you set before you got started? And look, those that hit their expectations, those that um, are finding success defined that way, they're ones that build bigger portfolios. They continue to build portfolios. They continue to grow what they're currently doing. They look for new ways to to um, tackle what their goals are, new ways to to set new expectations. I mean, it, that's just what, what happens. Success leads to more success no matter how you define it. So today's the day that I get to talk about what's the difference? How are they separated? What is one group doing that another is not? And I really zero in on one key factor. Asking better questions. So I'm going to go through today and this isn't, this isn't like my past episodes of what questions do you ask, but it's what questions are they asking that others are not, okay? So I'm going to jump, jump in. We're going to dive into this, kind of unpack it a little bit. Feel free to leave your comments in the comment section. Feel free to ask questions. Feel free to let us know what you think. Happy to engage. Happy to, to um, you know, kind of knock this out a little bit and let people ask you know, or share even what their own questions are they think you know, need to be asked in order to you know, be successful if you define it by hitting your goals. So number one, right off the bat, I think the, the differentiator is that successful investors, they actually have a list of questions. So it's not just a case of, are we asking things, but it's, they, they have a list. They have a, a list that they use every single time. This is every single time on, uh, if they're going to choose to be passive and go to a new city, they're asking the same questions, uh, about every single city. If they are, looking to work with a new partner. Maybe they need a new management company or a new builder or a new real estate agent or whatever, but they're asking the same questions. They have a, a guideline that they use to determine um, whether or not this is somebody good to work with or whether or not this is a good deal. Same thing, of course, happens with the deal, with the, with the houses themselves. They're, they're not going in and necessarily going off their gut. I know plenty of people that, that invest off their gut they, you know, how do I feel about this? But that's not what, uh, in my view and in my years of experience, that's not what the best investors do. That's not what the most successful investors make a habit of. They ask the same questions. They work from a list. So example of, you know, some questions that I think are always important to be asking is of course the numbers. And we all know like right off the top, what's the big numbers? What's my return going to be? Well, hell, a, a investor that knows how to hit their expectations isn't going to ask that question. They're going to be much more specific. What will my ROI be on, on my down payment? What will my IRR be based on these assumptions, you know, in selling in five years? What will, you know, whatever it ends up being, it's I plug in these numbers. What is the computation that kind of that spits out on the other side? They're not going in saying, you know, what's my return going to be? What's my percentage? What's they're not asking questions that that um, are so open ended and so they're just not thoughtful. A major pet peeve of mine, and I'm gonna if you're out there write this down. But 
Um, and feel free to argue with me on it. But I'm gonna. I've got a a, a acquaintance that I used to know through the website Bigger Pockets, and he and I used to have lots of conversations. And I'll tell you what attracted me to a conversation with this guy was that he didn't like my business model. And he didn't mind telling people that my business model was a scam and, you know, that I was going to be hurting people and ripping people off. And the only person making money was me and all this kind of stuff. And that's, that was okay because that was the reputation for turnkey investing back, you know, in the, in, you know, 2008 to 2012, 13, 14, that time frame, there wasn't a good reputation. There was lots of, uh, I'll just use the loose term of knuckleheads out there that, that were, um, operating and, and giving turnkey investing a bad name. That's fine. But what, you know, what got us talking and got us to where we were friendly was I engaged with him. I was more than happy to, to jump in and, and answer his questions and challenge him on the veracity of some of his claims. And then, and also support him when he made a claim. And I was like, look, you know, you're, there might be somebody out there or some company he might, you know, mention somebody's name and you're correct. But you know, that may not be the industry. That may not be every investor that wants to be passive or turnkey or whatever. But one of the things that that uh, he used to really, really harp on was being an educated investor, asking better questions. And he he would push hard on the fact that you cannot have a cap rate on a single family home when there's no historical you know why? You know, you if you cannot figure out what a if there has never been a net operating income, then you can't just assume one and calculate a cap rate. Somewhere along the line, somebody figured out that if you talk with really fancy language real high up, people won't ask you more questions. So people started advertising to single family home buyers that there were cap rates on their houses and that got people that that earned people's earned the credibility. Made people say, "Well, I'll pay attention to you because you're talking cap rates, and cap rates are really fancy language of some you know bigger investment. So, I'll talk your language. If you're talking cap rates, I'm in. You must know a thing or two. When in reality, single family homes can't have cap rates. If you don't have an NOI that you can look back on, especially an historical NOI, how are you gonna how are you gonna get a cap rate? So, if you're out there and you're looking to buy single family homes and you're looking, all right, so how do I ask better questions and what do I do? Don't ask what the cap rate is. Because unless a home has been in service for, and I, for me, it's a minimum of five to 10 years, there can't be a cap rate. Can you calculate one? Sure. You can plug in an NOI. You can kind of plug in whatever the hell you want to plug in. You can come up with anything, but that doesn't mean it's accurate or true. So really good investors, especially single family homes that are going to hit their expectations, they're not talking about cap rates. They're talking about some form of return that is appropriate for a single family home. So let me finish that just so everybody understands that cap rates are appropriate when you are trying to judge, should I buy this small eight unit apartment complex or this small eight bay um, you know, shopping center? These are two completely different commercial assets that both will operate completely differently. But there is a way to compare them to see which one will operate better or offer you a better return on your investment, which would be calculated through a cap rate. You can take a historical NOI on both of them. You can calculate every number the exact same on these two very different investments to determine what's the better investment for you. That's why you use a cap rate for commercial assets that cannot be easily compared and you don't use a cap rate for a single family home, which is super simple. You plug in to figure out what your ROI is going to be. I will spend this many dollars. I will anticipate these assumptions on numbers. This will be my return. So whoo. That was uh, I got off my I get off my soapbox there. It's really funny. The the gentleman's name was Bill, and some of the listeners may remember Bill from from Bigger Pockets out of Hawaii many many years ago. Just a tremendous amount of respect for this gentleman because uh, man, we went back and forth and had some great conversations and great debates. Um, but he was he was super good at at helping me understand that you know really the whole point of this podcast. How do you become a better investor? You ask better questions. So here's my here's. 
you know, I'm 10 minutes in. I want to make sure that I really drive this point home because this is the crux of the whole podcast today. When you're talking to someone, and I'm going to, I'm going to, really pivot to passive turnkey properties. When you're making passive investments and you're looking for, you know, how do I ask better questions? How do I hit my uh, expectations? And how do I become what I would define as a successful investor? You, You kind of almost revert back to childhood and you ask the question, why? You want to challenge the assumptions. You want to challenge the numbers. You want to challenge the answers that you're getting to the questions you're asking with why. Why? Someone says, um, we're a really good management company. We'll use my premier property management company as an example. So we absolutely no problem whatsoever telling an investor that the average length of time a property is occupied with our company is approaching seven years. A really good investor doesn't say, wow, that's amazing. I mean, they might, that might be their first response. That's, that's incredible. That's like unheard of in this industry. Their next question is going to be how, why, why do people stay for seven years? How do you do that? They want to know what the ins and the outs are. What are the details? I want to dig deeper. It's not enough for you to tell me some data point that sounds really good I want to know why why are you so successful at keeping people in your houses for seven years that's where you get the real answers because people that that are spouting off a bunch of of really good rhetoric that's really good marketing to suck you in and draw you in they can't answer it we're just really good at it you know we treat people really good and we you know, we, we like to treat people, we, we use the word resident, which you may have heard from somebody like REI Nation is a really important thing. So we, we call them residents. That doesn't work. That, that's, not a, that's not a why. Tell me why. Why do people stay for seven years? And then for us, it's going to be. Well, we answer every call from residents. And when we can't, yes, it, we have a voicemail system set up. Nobody wants to talk to a voicemail system, and we know that. But it's there to make sure that they can leave that message right then. And then we return all of those calls. And then we're not done. We do the one thing that I will never forget. This gentleman on stage at an event I'm speaking at gets up on stage. It's a property management uh, event. And he's trying to sell a easy button to property management companies, a done for you system where it's all automated. And he says the number one worst question you can ever ask one of your tenants is, Is there anything else you need? Stop asking that question. Don't do it. That's the worst question you can ask. All that does is lead to more work. Well, I was lucky enough to be speaking about two hours after him, and I went up there and said, the number one question we ask that is the differentiator makes us 10 times better than anyone else. It's why we blow everyone in this room's numbers away is because we call every resident, not tenant, back after we've done work and says, Are you satisfied? Is there anything else you need? And as second you show somebody how much you care about them, they will in turn reciprocate and show you how much they care about the service you give. That's why people stay for almost seven years with us. And we plan on getting that to 10. Can we get an average of 10-year occupancy? It's unheard of in this industry, but that's our goal. That's what we're trying to drive it to. It only happens... When, or you, the only way you're going to get the answer and find out why that is so successful is when you ask the question, why, how, how do you do this? When you talk with someone about, uh, or when you make an assumption, if you're going to buy something from somebody and you want to ask better questions and you, you know, you ask, um, about deferred maintenance or you ask about cap X expenses, no matter what answers you get, when you ask about how good their management company is, when you ask about anything, the school systems, the roads, the, you know, whatever that's important to you, don't just stop with the superficial across the surface. Here's the top, you know, question that I've asked. And by the way, I think that we can link in this podcast, we'll link to questions that you should ask every turnkey company before you do business with them. I know we've written this in a blog. I know we've done a podcast. So it's, look, it's going to be there. We're going to put the links in there. Um, Go back and look at it, but understand, like, These are great questions to ask if you want to find a good company or if you want to find a good management company or if you want to make a good investment on a good property to understand how it's going to work. But don't stop there. 
the single number one most important question successful investors ask is why? And if they're not asking why, they're asking how. It's the same thing. It's the details. Your answers are good. The details are great. The, you know, your, your data is fantastic, but dig, tell me. Like it's one thing to have data. It's another to understand exactly how you're getting there and how you move it. There's only so many investors out there that really understand this point. And I would believe that if you're listening to this podcast, you want to be one of them. You want to be an investor that understands that this isn't science and it's not magic. There is a, there is a, there's an art to it, if for lack of a better way. There is a reason behind performance. And in order to get to that, you must dig deeper. You must ask the questions why and how. Don't take results. Don't take expectations at face value. Don't take data points at face value. Before you buy another investment property, don't just look at a, at a spreadsheet and say, okay, cool. Ask. I promise you, a company like REI Nation, you ask us how, why, man, we're, I mean, you probably have a person on the other line that's going to start grinning ear to ear because that's, that's like music to our ears. We love to talk about our company because we understand, we know, we are consciously trying to be different than everybody else. And so as an investor, my advice is to do the same. Be different than every other investor that's out there. Separate yourself. Become one that you know in your own mind, I am successful. I have my expectations. I don't take things at face value. I dig in. I ask why. I ask how. I want to know, you know how and why everything works together. And then ultimately in the end, because I ask these questions, I hit my expectations. That's my wish for everybody that's out there listening today. Guys, I really appreciate you listening to The Grind. Uh, that's going to be it for today. But like I just said earlier, man, I am super excited for these next few episodes that are coming up because uh, I give all the credit to Isabella, who y'all will meet at some point. Uh, I promise there really is an Isabella here that works with us. She's come up with these really, really good uh, podcast topics mixed in with some, eh, you know, which I kicked those out. I only took the good ones, but they were hers, and they are fantastic. I'm super excited to, to record them. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, Yes, she is. You know, she's looking at me like I'm crazy right now, but I've enjoyed it. Thank you for joining me today. Until we get a chance to, to meet again right here, commit to the grind. We'll see you soon. Thanks, guys.